I grew up in uh, Queens County. I was born in St. Joseph's Hospital, September 1st, 1944. My father was in France, in the Army, in the Accounting Corps. My mother was living with her mother and father. And um, for 11 months, I lived with my mother, her parents, in Far Rockaway. And when my father came home, I was 11 months old. And every man approaching the crib, my grandmother or grandfather or mother would say, Dada, Dada, Dada. So when my father appeared, I went, Dada, Dada. And he said, oh, she's so smart. It's my family. It's my side of the family. I don't know if I was smart or not smart. And I often tried to think, what is my first memory? Because we like to get there in our mind to see how far we can go back. And I think this is it. When a door was opening, I was lying down, I was picked up, and somebody said, lamb chop? Because I remember when I was a baby eating all the time. I'm not even a baby boomer. I was born when the war was still on. But if you were healthy in those days, you were fat. So I had thighs and a big face and food all the time because it meant, I guess, that you were bringing enough money in to feed your entire family. So my father comes home, and we live with my grandmother and grandfather for two and a half years, and then we move to Laurelton, which is also in Queens County. Now keep in mind, Far Rockaway, where I was born, and Queens County, is in Queens County, as is Laurelton. But as I grew up, I thought New York City was only Manhattan. You would say you're going into the city. It always meant Manhattan. So here I am growing up in Laurelton. Every house looks alike. This is post-World War II, Cape Cod houses. And I have a brother. He's two years and nine months younger than me. And I have no memory of sibling rivalry early on. I just knew that nobody paid attention to me. They won't pay attention to my brother either. Because I had parents that were bachelors who got married. They were 11 years apart, they had a lot of interests, and their children were just two interests, but not really the focal point of their attention. So I grew up close to my brother, because we hung out together, because I don't know where my mother and father were. And I remember walking and talking early. And I also remember my brother Paul speaking some kind of language he made up, and I was the official translator. And one time he's walking around limping, And my mother turns to me and says, what's wrong with Paul? So I ask my brother, in what I'm thinking is English, I don't know. And he goes, ma, 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 his foot hurts. And she would open up the shoes and she found rolled up socks inside the shoes. So I grew up close to my brother. It's eventually known as Hansel and Gretel bonding. It happens in the animal kingdom. A sibling provides for you maternal and paternal affection that you don't get enough of from your mother and father. It doesn't mean they're mean or awful. They could have five jobs. They could be away traveling. They could love you dearly, but they didn't get the love they needed to express for their children. So I would say to you, I am a product of total, unadulterated, benign neglect. Maybe my mother was. Maybe my father was. My father was born in 1907. My mother was born in 1918. And if you have a little therapy, you begin to understand you can't teach what you don't know. So I grow up and my grandmother notices my left eye is crossing, not my mother. Get the idea? Where the heck is my mother? I don't know. And I have two eye operations when I'm five. I go to my grandmother's eye doctor. My mother cannot drive. She asks a neighbor to drive me and my mother's in the back seat. I get, as far as I remember, not a word of comfort, not a word of saying you'll be okay. I just knew I was on my own early on. My mother was emotionally useless. She yelled all the time. Everything was tragic. I didn't know if an empty milk container was the equivalent of murdering the neighbor. So I have my first set of eye operations is to cut the muscle. And I had wooden splints on my arms. And I come home and I say to myself, I didn't like those wooden splints because I'm told I have to have another eye operation. So I say to the doctor, I'm five. Dr. Esteman, I do not want those wooden splints. You told me 
not to touch my eye. I will not touch my eye. And he says to me, you are the first child who ever gave me directions. I did not know that was unusual. Later on, my father would say, you always had a will. And I don't know if will means you're stubborn, or will means you're born with a point of view, or will means you're a free spirit. Because if you dissect the word free spirit, it means you know your spirit, you know what makes you happy, and you work and live through it by protecting it. And your decisions protect your spirit. I don't know. And if you say, I don't know, throughout your entire life, you open up doors for understanding because nobody knows anything. We all memorize these answers. We don't have an answer. The mind wants an answer to the question, so we make up one. So I have eye operations. When I'm seven years old, I am sexually molested. I could not tell you this. I could not bring it up until COVID because during COVID, I learned to paint. And through painting, I saw the person who molested me. And I understood why I went this way when I could have gone this way because I was traumatized. And I understand for those of you out there who meditate, painting is the highest form of meditation. There's no thinking, there's no judgment. You express your emotions through your acrylics or your oils or your crayons. And there you have your life on canvas. And suddenly I saw this man. We lived in these houses that looked alike. And across the street from our house with red shutters, lived a house with green shutters. And Ruth and Arnie Spivak lived there. And Arnie's father molested me in the basement of that house twice. The third time I told him, go away. I couldn't have said this the way I'm saying it now, but I did mention it in a solo show that I wrote in 2017. I did mention to the director I was molested, but I couldn't give you the details that I give now or feel the emotion that I feel now. But I wanted to say to the director, it's in the script, but it's not about being molested. It's just one of the things that happened to me. But through painting, I realized all trauma forms your personality. And trauma means a wound. How are you wounded? And where you are wounded, eventually you will find yourself crippled in development unless you address it. And I'm 78 and I'm addressing my wounds. I'm in physical therapy because my back gave out and I'm in mental therapy because I'm wanting to know I could die soon. How can I develop myself and open myself to a larger world if I accept my eye operations, if I accept being molested, if I accept my devotion to my brother who dies, which is when I want to kill myself, that these are parts of my development and these are parts of what I should throw into my art or my theater or my performance pieces because we all suffer. And only the wise see suffering as a learning experience. And we only become interesting because we suffer. So I grow up in Queens and I knew I was articulate. I knew I was highly energetic and I knew I was wacky. I just wanted to be with my brother. And I kept on asking my father, Daddy, how do you know when you know yourself? Because I had read about the Oracle at Delphi, which says, know thyself. Yes. What does that mean? I want to know myself. And my father would say, go outside and play ball. You're too young to be thinking like this. It never left me. I used to watch Victory at Sea on TV because I wanted to see people die because I knew I would die. And that was my first idea that I am temporary. And I, as a temporary person, we have to know who we are. And how did I know I was temporary? I was about 10 years old and Florence Reich lives next door. And her sister has multiple sclerosis. And every time I see her, she's frailer and paler. Her husband first takes her with a cane, then a walker, then he's carrying her, and then she dies. And I say to my father, what happened to Flory's sister? She died. And I said, Daddy, what does that mean? We will never see her again. So I would stare at myself in the mirror and say, one day I won't be able to see myself. And I would cry because what am I? Who am I? What do I want? I didn't know my trauma 
paralyzed my desires. And I did not know my trauma made me feel unworthy. Whatever happened to me, I accepted. So I, I'm, I was smart. I love school. But at ninth grade, I sort of dipped this way. I didn't care anymore. It didn't get me what I wanted. And I couldn't tell you what I precisely wanted. So I graduate high school, a very overcrowded city school called Andrew Jackson. We were baby boom. I wasn't a baby boomer, but baby boomers. I had skipped the eighth grade. We had three sessions. I went to junior high school, 59, the, the year it opened up. Then I went to Andrew Jackson High School as a sophomore, 1237 to 437. It was too crowded to have a full schedule for those in attendance. Then I went as a junior from 807 to 207. And then I went as a senior from, from 807 to 1237. No study, no gym, no lunch. Because it was so overcrowded, it was built for 3,000 students. There were 5,000 students in the school. I didn't know I was lost. I was lost, but I didn't know I was lost. You can't know you're lost until you're found. So I go to school in Albany, the State University in Albany. I just knew I wanted to get away. I didn't know why I wanted to get away. I couldn't tell you the torture I felt. I knew zero. I don't know anything. But I knew there was no tuition at a state school in New York, and my fa family didn't have a lot of money. And I was always uh, aware of that. So I went to the State University at Albany. There were no, but 650 people were in my graduating class. I graduated high school with 1,100 people. So it's the reverse. It's, I went to high school, but it was college. It was small. It was rural. It was so sweet and adorable. And every time there was a mixer, I never went out. I never went to a mixer. And I couldn't tell you why I self-isolated, but I can now. I was embarrassed and I was molested. I felt sullied. I didn't, I didn't know how to talk to a guy. I wasn't interested in women. I just was not trusting of anyone. I couldn't be close to anyone. I didn't know I was phobic. I didn't know I had self-loathing. I knew nothing. Then I get money from the University of Illinois. I have a BA in history. I get a master's in teaching social studies at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. I meet a guy. His name is Lee Stelzer. And we go out. And he's the first guy I have sex with. Well, I went, this is interesting. It's fun. I like it. And he says something like this, if memory serves, I adore you, let's get married. And I'm thinking I'm supposed to get married because I'm on the cusp of feminism. Should you be a virgin? Shouldn't you be a virgin? Do you marry as a virgin? How important is sex? I knew nothing. So I said to him, I can't marry you. I don't want to do your laundry. And scared the shit out of me. What the hell? What kind of answer is that? I never said I love you. I never said I don't love you. Oh, let's have children. I just saw marriage as servitude. I saw I didn't know who I was and I can't devote myself to anybody else. Who am I? And then in my 20s, I had a few other sexual liaisons, whatever you want to call it, but I never said to myself, I want to get married. I want children. I just said, I can't do this. Who am I? I don't even know who I am. I have such self-rage and self-anger. So I start out as a teacher at Herrick Senior High School in North New Hyde Park. I was a teacher of social studies, 10th grade. A fabulous teacher, 10 minutes. Then I took up smoking because I was bored. I said, oh, I, I gotta do something different. So when the teacher's lounge, I would smoke and cough. <laughs> and I'd go back to teaching. We'd play the records, Beatles were there. I requisitioned the record player from audio visual. And I was a fabulous teacher when I focused, but I didn't know I had attention deficit hyper disorder. I didn't know, I didn't like being indoors. I didn't like seeing the same people every day. And I quit after three years. And then I get a job at Random House. I'm a fabulous writer for 10 minutes. And I worked with Toni Morrison. I knew her very well. L.W. Singer was a textbook company. They buy at Random House, and I'm already working in Random House, and I have a desk, three desks away from Toni Morrison. And she says to me one day, you never sit at your desk. I said, I know I'm afflicted. I don't know what it is, I have to walk around. And she says, you don't concentrate. I know I don't concentrate. I don't know how to fix it. And she lived, of all places, in Laurelton, and I lived in Manhattan. She had an apartment, she had two sons, and she was asked to look at the galleys of, I always mix them up, between Ebony and Essence. One of them was, was a newer one. I think it's Essence, 
Ebony's the old one. So Essence comes out. Toni Morrison is asked to look at the galleys, and she invites me and a few other people to look at the galleys with her. I take the train out to Laurelton. I get the heebie-jeebies because I grew up there, and I went, oh, I was so nervous. I was so anxious. Not that I'm any different. I was still a nervous and anxious wreck. And then I get fired from Random House. I was warned many times. You're never sitting in your seat. You don't finish the assignments. But I was an excellent writer. So every time they gave me anything original to write, I was superb. But anything else, I didn't want to do it. But I was warned and I get fired. So I decide to move to St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, because I didn't know I had minimum body fat. I just knew I was always cold in the summer and I felt abandoned and I felt orphaned. And I figured it out. If I move to St. Thomas, it's always warm. I'll always be happy. I had no idea wherever you go, you take yourself. So if I'm malformed, disorganized, a nut job, well, that nut job goes to a place that has weather from 82 to 92 degrees. And all you can do is you can have sex or you can take drugs or you can drink. That's great on a vacation, not in real life. I stayed a year and I came back and I got a job at Hearst Magazines as the secretary to the controller, the accounting department. So I'm uh, interviewed by Maria Pirro in the Hearst personnel office, which is today Human Resources. And she takes a look at me and she goes, what are you doing in business, in, in accounting? He's going to hire you because you're attractive. But this is not for you. You're an actor. And my sister Diane is in an amateur acting troupe. And I think you should call her up and do one of those plays they do with St. Jean the Baptist in the basement. So I get a job with John DeVolio, who's the controller. And it is the worst job I ever had, but I last for two years. Don't ask me how or why. And I call up Diane Pirro and I go down to St. John the Baptist and I get into the place, Boone River Anthology. And I loved it. I loved memorizing the words. I loved being an actor. I loved whatever it required. And then uh, I get fired from the job at, Her at Hearst Magazines after two years, but I was warned 100,000 times. My boss was a sex, a sex guy who was always at Plato's retreat. He was married and he had a daughter, but he had a huge sexual appetite. And I knew this. And as a secretary, you're supposed to keep your mouth shut. I didn't do that. Somebody would say, where's John DeVolio? I'd say he's at Plato's retreat and he has a bad back. I don't know what he's doing there. He's going to come back crooked. And eventually he says to me, you've got a big mouth. And I knew you had a big mouth and I'm going to fire you. But here's the interesting thing about my brain. While I was the control, I, the, one of the secretaries for the controller, this guy, Vince, was working for my boss and his wife was a travel agent. This is before computers. And I had this thing about Marshall Tito. I wanted to see Yugoslavia before it fell apart because I had a thing for the cult of the personality. Tito, Castro, and Anwar Sadat were the three people I worshiped. Do you see where I'm out to lunch? I'm not in the present tense. And I went to Israel in 1988 but I didn't go to Egypt because I'm Jewish and I felt bad I shouldn't go to Egypt, spend my money there. But when Sadat was bumped off, I felt awful. So I had two people left, Castro and Marshal Tito. Well, this is in the 70s and Marshal Tito's alive and he arrests anyone who disagrees with him. So that country's pretty strong. So I say to Vince, ask your wife if she has any tours going to Yugoslavia. And she comes back, he comes back with a brochure and he gives it to me. He says, yes, this tour. And it's for two and a half weeks. I sign up. There's only three of us on the tour. But we, we join other tours while we're in Yugoslavia. And the two other people on the tour was May Dodge Rogers, who grew up in East Hampton, and the library is named after her family, and the waitress in the diner that she went all the time as her traveling companion. And I'm a third. I love them both. They were nuts. I didn't know they were nuts. They were my kind of people. They didn't finish a sentence. They drifted off. And we hung out together. I come back. And May Dodge Rogers, who's filthy rich, I did not know this, sends me $330 for my 33rd birthday. I'm unemployed. I'm taking care of my brother's dog. And I see that $330 and I say to myself, I want to do something. If I never had this money, I couldn't do. So I said, I'm going to go to acting school. I remembered what Maria Pirro said. You're a natural actress. So I only knew about two schools, the Neighborhood Playhouse and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So I call up the neighborhood playhouse, and now it's a summer school. I didn't think high school. It's high school kids. I just thought, it's in the summer, it's school. And the neighborhood playhouse, the woman answers the phone and says, we're all booked up for our summer school. But for you, we would open it up. You have a magnificent speaking voice. I started to cry because I want to tell you something. You have to find where your assets are assets. 
If you have assets and they're looked at as liabilities, you believe they're your liability. I had a deep voice. I would pick up the phone and people thought I was my brother Paul. When I was teaching, I was very good friends with Janice Goldberg. Her mother says to me, your voice is like a man's. Is there any way you can raise it? And I took whatever anyone said to me as to my heart and I thought it was my fault. There's something wrong with me that I didn't fit in. And I want to tell you something. The biggest gift you can give yourself is to honor that you don't fit in. So the neighborhood playhouse says, we will open it up for you. Come down with a monologue. I didn't know what she was talking about, a monologue. And I said, how much is it? She said, $350. So I saw that as a sign from God. I had $330. We're a bad fit. So I call up the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. They had openings. It was $330. So I go to acting school at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. It was the summer of, I'm going to make it up, but I'm close, 77, 1977. I was the oldest person by 20 years. Everybody was in high school. However, if the acting teacher said to me, lie down on the floor and pretend you're the color red, I was like, okay, I'll do that. I had no argument. I didn't say we didn't do that in high school. We didn't do that in my drama class. I had no template whatsoever. At the end of the six weeks, Dennis Moore, who was my acting teacher, said, you are a natural actress, but now it'd be actor. You are a natural actor. Why don't you think of going to school at the American Academy, but go at night, but you're coming in with a lot of stuff. And I was a sponge, because I had no direction ever from anyone. And I always took what someone else saw me as, as what I was, because I was empty. I didn't know who I was. Nor did I get direction ever from my mother and father, even to rebel against. So I go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts at night. I loved every moment, four nights a week. I loved every moment. I graduate. I audition for one role. I forget everything. Everything. I'm so nervous. I try to speak. And it comes out like a death bell. I'm scared to death. I call up my cousin Alvin, who's a doctor, and he says to me, I'll give you beta blockers. What are they? They slow down your heartbeat. No, I will just never audition again. So I become a waitress in Zlotnik's Daughter. That is a restaurant on the bottom of the City Corps building, which is the building on the horizon that has a slanty roof. It was au courant, technologically advanced when it opened up in the 70s because it had a tuned mass damper on the roof that controlled the wind velocity around the edifice to adjust to anything that could happen to the foundation. And I'm a waitress in Zlotnik's daughter, and they always think I'm Zlotnik's daughter. No, she was someone in Canada. And we had a manager, and it was like a diner. And I had regulars because I would sit down with everybody and talk to them. Of course, my manager hit the ceiling. He says, what's the matter with you? You're a waitress. You should be walking around. I said, well, I just love everybody. I want to talk to them. And I would give away free brownies, free blondies. Because we had a huge dessert bar. And two guys would come in all the time. And one of them finally says to me, I think you should become a tour guide. We work at Grey Line. You're such a natural storyteller. You were born here and you have such an interesting point of view. Well, I listened to that. And, they, and I said, how do you become a tour guide? He said, you got to go down to 80 Lafayette Street and take a test. So I went down to 80 La Lafayette Street. At that time, it was the Department of Consumer Affairs. I took a test, how to become a tour guide. It was multiple choice. It was fill in. There were no essays because the guy who answered it was from Pakistan. He couldn't even understand English. So it was A, B, A, C, true, false, true, false. And you pass or you fail. While I was a waitress at Zlotnik's daughter, Meryl Streep came in because Meryl Streep was appearing in, I want to say, Social Security. It was right next door at a little theater, right, right next to uh, the City Corps building in St. It's a church, a little theater. And she had glasses on that were missing an ear. And I said to her, you need to get a safety pin and put the ear in. She says, well, I'll get around to it. She wore overalls. And later on, she became world famous. So I take the test. I go to Grey Line. 
I looked for those two guys. One's name was Jim, the other was George. And they said, ask Max, he's the dispatcher, tell him you're here as a student guide. So I was a student guide. I sat in the back of the bus. I had passed the test. It was a very fair test. I got some questions wrong, but it was an overview of if you're in New York, what things should you see and some kind of understanding of the city itself. And then he, Max said to me, when you feel you're ready, you come and tell me and I will give you a tour. So I worked, I don't know how many times, maybe 10 times in the back of the bus. I'm making that up. And you make it up. You think, oh, I'm ready. Because it's really hands-on. What are you ready for anyway? Nothing. Who knows what's going to happen? So I get the tour and Max says, well, we have a new driver with you. And I say to him, are you crazy? I need an old driver. I'm new. He says, it's not union rules. So I have a new driver from New Jersey, a bus that we subcontracted, and me. I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm nervous. And you know when you're nervous, you sabotage yourself. And it's the gay day parade. So the only route I know is occupied by people who are in the parade. So I say to the driver, right by Washington Square, make a left. He says, I can't make a left. It's not, it's not wide enough for my, the back of my bus. And we couldn't back up. I mean, years later, I got into things and I would run out and back up the traffic, but then I was paralyzed. I didn't know what I was doing. I said, you can do it, you can do it, think positive. So he turns and he hits the car. So the first day out, I'm in a bus accident and the police come, and everybody comes and I think they'll never hire me again, but they did and they called me Demolition Debbie. So I worked at Gray Line for X amount of years as a freelancer, I liked it. I liked it a lot, but you know what I liked? The microphone giving you my point of view. And I had information, it wasn't, I wasn't a sham, I was quite good, but I was funny, I am funny. And I was interesting and I like strangers. It's intimacy that kills me. I like the fluidity of new people in front of me continuously. And I got to be known and I worked a lot. I never worked a lot because people annoy me. I worked maybe four months a year and I lived very modestly. And I was in the Daily News centerfold I, there was a little article about me in New York Magazine. Um, I was interviewed on TV a lot, but I'm a little off the wall. See, here's an example. My insanity in real life works as a tour guide because people want to be entertained while they're learning. They want to be with someone who's a little off the wall, a little unusual, who brings in things from the outside world and makes a sort of a conclusion. But in real life, if you're talking to someone like that, you can drive them crazy. But now I don't apologize anymore. And I have to say to you, stay with it. You have to find out who you are. It's the wilderness, you are the wilderness. But if you give up, you might as well kill yourself emotionally, spiritually, while you're standing vertical. And everything is courage. Everything is the ability to see the unknown as a gift, not to scare you to death, which it has done in the past. And you have to own your frailty. You have to own your vulnerability. You have to own what, what you missed out and give it to yourself. So in the end, which is our beginning, which is our rebirth. We become our own mother, father, sister, brother, lover. What are the advantages of living in New York City? First of all, if you lived here all your life, you don't even know it's uh, unusual. That's the unusual thing about it. You have to travel to see that where you live is a little bubble. It's a, it doesn't exist anywhere else. And then once you travel and you see that it doesn't exist anywhere else and you come back and you cherish it, but you don't cherish it for the commodity that people think it is. You cherish it not in a money sense and not in what you can buy, in the air that you breathe. Because what's in the air you breathe, the variety of life, the choices that we all make, the, what we live with, our own little stories, they're all in the corner. And the world, every ethnic group is here, all the languages are on the corner you feel insignificant because let me tell you, you are insignificant, you're a speck. And when you live here, the speck is apparent because you're gonna disappear. Not only are you a speck, it's a double whammy. You're not gonna be here forever, you're temporary. So why do you think you're so important? Why are you a solipsist? Why are you the center of the universe? You are not. And once you discover the universe is around you, you can travel going to the corner and talking to different people, your eyes open up. What are the options here? They're immense. And what are people walking with? They're walking with blood, sweat, and tears, and tragedy. And how do you know that? You gotta talk to them. And how do you talk to them? You find the question that opens them up because we all wanna be heard. We all have a story. We want to be excited. 
We want exertion, we want energy, and we want exercise. And when we don't get those, we become depressed. And some of us don't know that we don't have them, and we walk around depressed. Because suddenly they laugh. And they say, you know, I haven't laughed in so long. And one of the gifts that I have, and I don't know where it came from, I always had a sense of humor. Even at my brother's funeral, I said to my father, uh, now I'm going to inherit whatever money you have. That's the advantage of having Paul die. He said, what kind of talk is that? Well, I'm trying to find something. Not that you have any money, Daddy, but you don't have another heir. I'm the only issue. Well, what kind of talk is that? Oh, I don't know. I'm just trying to cons console myself. Con what's the word, Dad? I want to console. Like, console myself because some things are unconsolable and you make up how you console yourself. The loss of a brother, you will never get over. The loss of a child, you will never get over. And the people who you love bring out things in you that other people don't. So what is your grief? Your grief, your grief is the absence of their corporal presence because their presence brings out something in you. And if you can't find it in another person, it is an ongoing absence and you live with it. And that's why I love the color spectrum, because the colors run from blue, true blue, green with envy, red with rage, orange for, orange for conciliation, yellow for sunshine. You put it together. And why am I wearing this? It's tone on tone. Why am I wearing this? Because I knew I was going to be in the camera. And I knew I speak in a very, I'm very dense and I'm very intellectual and I can be thick and I can be thought provoking. And I just wanted to be ready for this, calmer in my attire because I didn't want to conflict with my verbiage. And what I have to say to you also is you never know parts of yourself unless you try it. And don't underestimate how brilliant you are and who you are. You do underestimate it because it's fear. And fear is going to come and strangle you in the neck and you'll be paralyzed, petrified like a tree. So what you have to pretend is you have to act like you're confident. Act like you can do anything. Act like you know what you're doing because nobody knows what they're doing and life is a series of disappointments. And that's the truth. Because we have expectations that we make up. We should go in it with no expectation. The only time you should applaud yourself is when you try something new and you live through it. And you didn't embarrass yourself to the degree. And I want to tell you how I embarrass myself, but you get over it. I have irritable bowel syndrome and sometimes I'll eat something and I'll make it in my pants in, the pu in public. And I have to go to a strange bathroom and say, excuse me, I had an accident. And you know something? You live through it. You live, you live through it. You live through everything until you can't live through everything. What do, what do you wish you knew? What do, what, do, what do you wish you understood in your 20s and 30s and 40s that you understand now? Uh, it's the irony of it. You only understand through aging that most things don't matter. But when you're young, you would say, oh my God, my hair, I can't believe how's my hair sticking up? And then I got the pimple over here. And then he said, and then she said, and I didn't know what to say. And I want to shoot myself. None of this matters. But I think you have to go through it to look back. Look as Kierkegaard says, the only life worth living is you're looking backwards, but we're going forward. And I also like Schopenhauer. Nobody likes him. They say he's a depressive, but I don't think he's a depressive. I think he's realistic. The only sign that there, these are, these are my words of Schopenhauer. The only sign there is a God out there. The only divine quality we have is our sense of humor. Then when you laugh, you think, oh, there's something larger than me because I didn't know I was going to laugh and I didn't know I was going to make someone else laugh. And if you can laugh and cry, you had a good day. I think you should laugh and cry every day because life's filled with emotions. What's your personality? Your personality is emotionally based. So depressed people are sitting on their emotions. They didn't have an avenue for expression. Get an exercise. Take up running. Take up a musical instrument. Scream and yell. Make a fool of yourself. Don't sit on anything. You'll get an ulcer. I don't know if you'll get an ulcer, but you'll get neurodermatitis. You'll start be scratching. And if you have someone that you disagree with, learn the skills that don't shut down the communication where you can communicate, have your point, but the person doesn't leave the room or tell you to drop dead. That's a skill and that's a gift you give yourself when you can express yourself without annihilating the person who's listening. If you had your life to live all over again, what would you have done differently? Oh, I, I don't know if, I don't know, I don't like the word regret because how can you know what you don't know? Because you don't even know you don't know it. You make lousy decisions. I wish I knew early on how much sex is a part of relationships with men or women. 
I, I was so scared of it because I was molested. I, I was so uncomfortable with it. I didn't look, I looked down, I looked up, I had sex, but it's not like I had sex. I wasn't in my body. I, I wish I, I caught my trauma earlier. I wish I caught my trauma. Oh, somebody said, go into therapy because this, this, and this is crippling you. I didn't have the courage or the insight or the foresight or, I don't know, to see it until COVID. And then I took a painting and painting released me, but I'm closing in on death. It's the irony of it. I'm closing in on my exit and I'm wanting to make an entrance because I'm now entering as my real person. But I don't think you can be real unless you fall on your face. You, I don't think anyone's born whole. Those very lucky people know exactly what they want to do early on. But are they lucky? I mean, sometimes you can say confusion can make you a more interesting person. Trying things out that don't work out can make you more interesting. A patina of interest. You come over to someone, you say, oh, they have so much to say. But a lot of things didn't work out for them. When everything works out for you, you don't get a story. What is the story based on? Disappointment and expectations. But you live through it. And every story builds your character. And I remember when I was growing up, my mother and father would say, put your pinky, put your finger down. I was harmless, but I always talked like this, harmless. And I wish I knew I was good looking. I didn't know that. I wish I knew that my, because my father never said, you're so beautiful. You know, I had very good looking mother and father. I had a good looking brother. He just was character driven. Character, who are you? No one ever told you you're beautiful? No. Recently they have. You know what, the first time someone told me I was beautiful, I was on a tour and someone said to me, guy, I can't take my eyes off you. I said, why? I, it was an enigma to me. I it was invisible to myself. I didn't see it. Now I see it. I have never looked better. Here's the conundrum of aging. When you age with reality and authenticity, you never look better. Simultaneously, you've never looked older. <laughs> so it goes together. I, I can't figure it. I don't have anything done with me. I'm, but here's no, my- but You're beautiful. Thank you. You're beautiful. Your yeah, energy, your, your I want to take mind, my hat off. Your... Okay. Um, I, I want to say this to everyone. And I want to say it to myself, the little girl inside of me, because what's happening to all of us? We walk around with the child that we, we had as a, we lost, oh, I'm still in here. That same sensitive, confused, the little child is there. And the adult has to become the parent to the child. And if the adult is nervous, that's me. You get two nervous people living in one body and you become neurotic. And I was early on very talented, but scared of everything. And if you're frightened, you're crippled. And somehow you have to work that through. And I, I, I don't have an easy suggestion because I'm 78 and I'm willing to go with the, what life has to offer now, but I could die at 80. We all could die. So let me rephrase that. My back is bad. And I don't know if that's aging or I'm giving up things that I carried that I shouldn't have carried before. I don't feel anything in my feet. Well, maybe I'm not supposed to feel so much. I don't know. I like everything as a metaphor. We all have regrets, period. But I want to use a better word than regret. We all needed adaptation earlier on. We just didn't adapt, we didn't know it. And I remember, um, oh, what's her name? She's a black American, the caged bird sings, Maya Angelou. She said, and this is genius, if you know better, you do better. I wish I knew better earlier. I think, just earlier, I would have had more fun. I'm having a lot of fun now because I recognize all my lovely qualities but I didn't recognize them. I just thought I was a failure because I'll tell you what I did. I saw, this is the way you go through life. I didn't know I was creative. Creative people or artists are this, they're over here. And the people I knew, I'm not saying they weren't artists, but they suppressed their art, they didn't touch it. They went this way. I wanted to go that way. I was so awkward with men. I was so awkward with the idea that you have to get married and have children. I was so young. Do you have kids? No, and I, I never wanted kids, but now I could be a good mother. Yeah because I, I get it, I know what love is. You'd be a great mother. Yes, I know what love is. I, I really can be, a, I'm, I'm now a parent to myself. So I, I was afraid of everything, but I look cocky. You know, you overcompensate. You look arrogant and cocky, but you don't know what you're doing. The other thing I want to tell you also, learn to grieve. That's what I'm doing now, I'm grieving because of the things I didn't do earlier, the things I didn't learn sooner. Allow yourself to grieve. You'll go through it and you'll become stronger and better. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're making it through. You know, life is difficult. A lot of people drink themselves into oblivion, take drugs because they don't want to be here. I'm a daydreamer. And my therapist says, own that. That's who you are. Your daydreaming saved you from doing anything awful. You just, I daydreamed that reality was better. But it's a gift you give yourself if you can learn to live with reality. You've had loves in your life? I had, this is a wonderful question for what, what is, 
you mean the opposite? I don't think I'm gay. I didn't get. I didn't look at women and say, "Oh, a vagina is really what I want." I once had an, a little triage, but a triage with a man and a woman. Neither one appealed to me. I mean, because he, I didn't like him. I didn't like her. So I, I would say to you, I'm perfectly straight. But picky, I'm a, a saber sexual, whatever that thing is. I love brilliant people. I love people who make me laugh. And I just, I, I just, I can't help, I mean, I can't help it. I never looked at a woman with lust. I've looked at a few men, but not a lot of men. So it's not like, oh, it's crazy, straight across the board. Okay, when I was. Uh, you never just, you never had anybody that just did it for you. Because I didn't know who I was. You know, you can, I can have someone now doing it for me because I know what I want. But you didn't, I didn't even know it then. So I would say my earliest experience that was, was Lee in graduate school because my first sexual experience. And he proposes to me. And I didn't, un, this is the part that shook me up. I, I don't know if I want to get married. I, I married to, but I thought I wanted to. But you know, you think you want something until someone asks you. And then when your answer shocks you, that means you really don't want it. Because this is the other thing I want to tell you. This is your belly brain. This is your cerebral brain. This is the brain that curses you out, censors you, and fear, it makes you frightened. Your belly brain, your intestines, your gut, that's your truth. Follow your belly brain. So when Lee said to me, let's get married, and I said, oh, I don't want to do your laundry. That was my belly brain, and I listened to it. But, oh, but here's it gets worse. Six weeks later, I changed my mind because everybody I knew was getting married, so I called him up. It's either six or eight weeks later, and he found another. Mm. And I said to myself, I was right. How can you find somebody? If this is the love of your okay. life, what the hell that means? How can you find somebody else? In, in eight, six or eight weeks. So I knew, then I started finding a, a people who were not white, very attractive. Chinese people, African Americans, Indians. When I went to graduate school, I was so popular. This is before, this, then I meet Lee, but I was so popular with men. I was shocked. I, why? Because I went from high school where I was invisible in, in college. I but never you, went. you didn't know or love yourself and you couldn't accept yes, it. Yes, yes. I, I think we go back to... That's a big problem for a lot of people. A, a big problem is lack of worth, mm -hmm. lack of self-love, and thinking you deserve certain things. You deserve them because you're a lovely human being. And I think once we cross that road of understanding, if we're not best friends with ourselves, we're doomed. Every day you wake up, you have two choices. You can be your own best friend or your own worst enemy. It's a choice every single day. You have to sleep eight hours a day. You have to eat correctly because you got to honor the vessel. This is the external. You are inside your vessel. You got to honor this vessel with correct nourishment. But I didn't know that either. I had self-loathing. I didn't have self-care. You cannot be around people who denigrate you, who criticize you, who make you wrong. You cannot tolerate them because the world out there is out to eviscerate you. And you have to be brave. And bravery comes from not being afraid of being alone not being afraid of the dark, and not being afraid of the unknown. And when you are brave and you are courageous, you can get a hold of the very kernel of who you are and embrace it and run with it. And, and life is so much more exciting. Absolutely life is so much more exciting when you know who you are. I mean, people, my, my dad used to say when I was a kid, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chase girls, you don't, what, you don't, what do you do? I think I have a gambling problem, but not, not a casino. Like I, can, I can go to Vegas and walk through a casino and think it's boring. But my gamble is with, with my career, with work, with things like that. Like this, this project is, is tremendously risky. Not, with, not when I'm interviewing someone like you, but some of the other people I've interviewed are. Well, you could get something, someone can go nuts in front of you. All or, kinds of problems. Yeah. Yes, and they, or go and, after and, you, and or excite, hit the camera, yeah. or, or have a, neuro, a breakdown in front of and you, the, and, and that, you don't know what to do. That blend of risk and my creativity, my art, is just addictive to me. But, but I'll tell you something truth, truthful, you can walk out of the house, Whatever your house is, apartment, a tent, I don't, and get hit with a brick, or get run over, or get a misfire. You know, somebody shoots at him, but they hit you by mistake. Mm -hmm. As soon as you leave, your confines of what your safety zone is. Um, we don't. I don't even know what a safety zone is, but your safety zone. You're subject to risk, and risk is scary. And I want to live with risk. I was frightened of it, and I, I don't want to be frightened of anything. See, anymore. I run towards it. Yeah, I, in a way, you want to run towards it, not being stupid. Not stupid. Yeah, yes, but you want—you don't want to jump in the pool when there's no water. But shallow, I'll paddle, I'll dog paddle. But I—I uh, I want to believe this is maybe a little cocky, cocky, stupid, meaning like seventy-eight that I could still find love. Yep, you can. And it looks it could be—I could still find love. I can still find work. 
that's, that has an income for me that touches my essence of humor and uh, inspiration and being older. You certainly and, have a lot to offer. And being older and play with words and go out there and wear silly clothing and just be there and be present. And I just want to love life. And I, I'm only doing it now that I'm in bad shape. <laughs> but I'm only using my back as a metaphor that maybe I'm releasing things that I shouldn't have been holding on to so long. So I, I, and I'm, I welcome any queries about my philosophy of life. My philosophy of life would be this. Say yes to most things. Say yes, unless your life's endangered or it's unethical. And I would also have um, a code. I'm very ethical. I hate this expression ethical. I'm, I like to do what's right if I know what right is. I like to fall asleep without worrying about the phone ringing in the middle of the night. I like to tell the truth if I know what the truth is. And I want to have a day where who I am matches my behavior. I want to have a day where peace of mind, because of the correct decision, invades my property. I want to have a day, this is the biggest thing I learned in therapy when I was in first in therapy. I can say when someone asks me a question, I don't know, can I get back to you? Or that may not work for me, may I get back to you? Or no, I don't want to do that, thank you. You don't know boundaries. If you're a people pleaser, you're screwed. You have to know your boundaries. And then once you establish your boundaries, you watch who falls away. The people who fall away are not your friends anyway. Your friends are really happy for you when you are successful with your life. They show up and applaud. Your friends are there when you have a car crash, you call them. When you win the lottery, you call them. Who do you call when you're at either end of your emotional spectrum? Extreme, extreme ecstasy or extreme despair. Those are your friends. Everyone else is in between. And you have basically 15 people in your life that you can say is your circle, but you have one good friend if you're lucky. And if you don't f- can't find anybody, it's got to be you. You're your default best friend. You wake up every day and say, I'm going to eat right, sleep right, do right, have a good day, and not worry about things I can't control. And I'm a natural warrior. I, I think the Russians are coming to get me any minute, and I have to hide in the root ba- basement. i got to get over my bad tape. My bad tape is... Catastro- cat- catastrophizing everything, and that comes from trauma. That is a trauma response. If something doesn't go the way you thought it would be, it's the end of you, you'll be in the Salvation Army, you'll be eating cat food, and that is a trauma response. You have to look at evidence, what is the truth, what is your reality, and you also have to believe you have something precious to offer, because in essence, you are precious cargo, at the very least, to you. And if you don't honor that, you will put yourself in harm's way and you will destroy who you are. And we're here to blossom and to blossom in place. And we're here to take courage and put it inside of us. And that's our bandwidth. And you live with your bandwidth and that's courage. Jane, what would you say, one message you would give to the audience watching? Everyone, young This is an ageless message. If someone asks you to do something, go somewhere, and your life's not in danger, and it's not unethical, and you can read about your behavior in tomorrow's paper, which is now on the internet, you say yes. Because you may get a story. You may find out about yourself. You may, it's the unknown you gotta say yes. If you say no, which I did so much in, in my life, you don't get a story, it's a flat line. You know exactly what it looks like. You're safe in your cocoon. So say yes. You're amazing.